Thank you, Clarence. Don't mind if I look there and instead of looking at the audience. Because for nine years now, on the 2nd of April every year, I've come and looked at that lake and looked at the banks of this lake and wondered to myself, is this what GM meant? Is this what the great master meant when he said more than 50 years ago that one day the axis of spirituality will move from the east to the west? And like we have so many seekers and so many people desirous of finding the truth and the spiritual understanding within themselves in the East, there will grow in the course of the next several decades a large number of seekers in the West who will look inwards in their hearts and in their souls to find the same beautiful truth that the mystics of the East have been proclaiming out there in India, in other Eastern cities of Eastern countries. And as I heard the great master, he was standing by the side on the bank of a river, which looked remarkably like this scene here. It was a big, wide river, the river Vyas. The bank of the river had ridges like this, it was high and you go down. So when I came and looked at this lake, it looked to me like the Bias River. And I came and saw it on the 2nd of April, 1984, the first April that occurred after my move to this country. And I have been coming here on the 2nd of April every year after that, including today for nine years, to look at this beautiful bank of this lake with great water and that we sit on the side on the bank of this and we talk about the very philosophy, the very message, the very teaching that the great master was teaching on the banks of the river 50 years ago. I had no idea when he said those things that I will ever have a chance to come to this country. He did not say those words to me. He said those words to an American disciple. One of the very rare experiences in the Dera of the master of those days to have a foreign disciple coming from the other side of the world. That when it is almost noon there, it's midnight here. And when it's midnight there, it's noon here. That you can be on the other side of the planet and a seeker is visiting from here and is talking to the same great master whose picture you see here. Beautiful white, silver white beard, beautiful eyes, beautiful forehead, a smile that spoke more than all his lectures, a smile that said, I know, you don't have to say. I know you, you don't have to tell me. I already know it. That kind of a smile, that kind of a look the man had, and here he was talking to a young missionary doctor, Dr. Julian Johnson, whose book some of you may have read, who was talking to him how much he had got just by looking at the master. And the master said, Johnson, you have come and taken a lot more. You will see in due course America from where you came. We'll take a lot more of this spirituality. The axis itself will shift. A time will come when people in the East who are so much oriented to looking for spiritual truth will look for dollars, rupees, gold. They will look for material things, homes, cars, televisions. They will ask for all the material goodies that you people are now running after. And when you will feel fed up with all those things and realize that all of them put together do not give you happiness and you will turn towards spirituality. That's the time when these people who are so content and peaceful, believing in the law of karma, will say, I want a new car. I want a new home. I want a bigger home because my neighbor X has a bigger home. I want still bigger home. 
this kind of rat race for material goods, which has been an impediment to growth of spirituality in the West, will shift from the West to the East. Those were strange words for me to hear. Over here, in fact, eavesdrop. But today, coming and finding the replica of that image here, year after year, on the 2nd of April, I can't help remembering the words of that great master and the impact he had and the impact those words had on me that I cannot forget them even now. Though more than half a century has passed since he said those words. The great master was great. I don't know anybody greater than him. I couldn't find anybody greater. I tried to look for one. I tried to find a man, beast, bird, <laughs> angel, angel, idea, book, religion, cult, philosophy. I tried everything. I couldn't find anything better, greater than the great master. I am very content. I found him. Rather, he found me. Because if by coincidence and circumstances I had not fallen into his lap, how could I have found him? There are so many masters in this world, so many gurus. Great master used to chuckle with laughter when he used to say, there are more gurus than disciples in this world. And if you want to look for guru, just pull up a brick and you'll find some gurus growing there. <laughs> it's difficult to find a disciple. It is difficult to find a good disciple. It's easier to find a guru. Because a good disciple is one who lives in the will of his guru. Who lives in the will of the Lord. It's very difficult to find one. Why should it be difficult? When a person acknowledges that so and so, an enlightened being, a person who has knowledge, is my guru, is my master, is my guide, why should it be difficult to follow that guru and say, I want to live in your will? It is difficult because of a very simple reason that the very being of the seeker, the very person of the seeker that is looking for a guru, accepting a guru, trying to live in the will of the guru is also enmeshed in consciousness, in his head, with a mental apparatus, with a mind that constantly cackles, constantly dabbles, constantly reasons, constantly tells things to do and not to do, and constantly tells why this is wrong, this is right, constantly passes judgment. This mind is sitting on top of us in such a strange and meshed way, so tightly knotted with the soul, with consciousness, that even when we want to live in the will of the Lord and say we want to be totally in his will, the mind speaks and says, yeah, if you listen to me, that's also the will of the Lord. After all, who created me? The Lord created me. It must be his will that you listen to me. If the indications from the Lord, from your guru, says go right, well, he said it five minutes ago, I am now coming in telling you go left. This also must be his instruction. The reasoning power that the mind employs can turn us totally in the opposite direction. How will we live in the will of the Lord? So long as the mind is so powerful and is so closely enmeshed in us that we cannot even distinguish whether the thought that comes in us is our own soul speaking or it's the mind speaking, how can we live in the will of the Lord? I get surprised by the large number of Seekers, I see in my travels and in my daily life all over the world. I have just returned after a very interesting trip through several countries around the world and I get fascinated by the number of people who are looking for the truth, who are looking for the Lord, who are looking for reality and they are looking with eagerness, they are looking with love and devotion. They are looking with the sincerity of a seeker. And yet, they are not successful. Something is coming in the way and they do not know what is coming in the way. It is their own mind coming in the way. And then tragically, 
Ironically, there are some who have realized it is the mind coming in the way and still they say, what can we do? It's the mind, not us. Blame the poor mind. What can we do? We only listen to the mind, tell the mind to give us good, good advice. They are so much trapped because these are not the words of the soul. To say, look at the mind, the mind is responsible, is not the words of the soul. To say, I want to do what I can understand, is not the words of the soul. Indeed, the soul speaks no words. All the words are spoken by the mind. Speech is the language of the mind. The words of the soul are listening to the melody, the music of this creation inside. The listening is the part of the soul. Listening and speaking must take place at the same time. You can never understand speech if you don't listen to it, even if it is in your own head. If the mind thinks out a thought in words, you don't know mind as thought unless you listen to it. Therefore, listening and speaking takes place simultaneously. And yet we do not realize that the listening is the soul. And the speaking is the mind. Therefore, we cannot find the will of the Lord by speaking. If we want to find the will of the Lord at any time, however alone and isolated we might be, all we have to do is to listen, but not listen to the mind, not to the speech. But to the melody, the rhythm, the love, the beauty that comes beyond words. Words are very local. Words are just part of language. Every language has a very short history. If you look back a few thousand years ago, the language we are speaking was never used, unknown. They said Sanskrit was there. Go a few thousand years more, there was no Sanskrit. Pali was there a few thousand years earlier, no Pali. There was no language that we know of today. All the languages we know of today have a very brief history. And in a universe that has been there for millions of years, we are talking of a few thousand years and we can't find a language that could have been universal, that could have been understood by the soul, which is immortal. Obviously, these words we use here are all mental. To go by these words and to say that we can live in the will of the Lord by understanding these words is a great mistake. That was one of the earliest lessons I learned from the great master when he said, forever distinguish between the Varanatmak Shabbat and the Dunatmak Shabbat. Varanatmak is that language which can be spoken, which can be written. What can be spoken and written and transmitted in words is Varanatmak has no truth in it. And there's a language called Dhunatmak, a melody, a sweet music, a rhythm, which cannot be written, cannot be spoken, cannot be transmitted in paper, and that is the true Shabbat. The true knowledge, the true word, the word that creates, the word that sustains, the word that is one with the Creator and the Lord. Distinguish between these two. Do not get messed up by a language that uses spoken or written words. These are all meant. Look for the language that cannot be spoken and cannot be written. He used to constantly refer to the Un unspoken and unwritten language of the mystics and the saints. Those who live in the will of the Lord listen to that language and not to the spoken language. Yet we are so engrossed in our mental activity, so <clears throat> ironically caught up in truth which can be couched in these words that we regale ourselves by reading over and over again. We get a book which records the experiences of those who had contact with the unspoken language, the unwritten word. And we read that and we rejoice. Somebody got it. And we keep on reading. We read over and over again. We read ten times, hundred times and think we got a lot out of it. We are reading about somebody who got it without reading. We are reading about the experiences of people who lived in the unspoken language and the unwritten word. 
And yet we are thinking the whole truth is in the written word. And then if one written word is different from the other, we are willing to kill each other. We have killed. The history of mankind shows that for this unreal language, the written language, for one word here or there, we have killed people. We have destroyed the very living temples in which that Lord was residing who we were looking for. And we did it in the name of our search for the same Lord. And we don't realize it is not on the written word only. From the writings, the scriptures, we start building our own temples. We start building our own churches, our own mosques, our own house of worship. And we use the most beautiful stones and the best bricks and the best building material and new architects and new designs. I sometimes wonder if they could make such beautiful designs on this earth to show it's the house of God. What would they do if they got a chance in the real kingdom of heaven? <coughs> These architects are so fascinated. Some are so devoted. But they forget one thing. That every house of God that they make is just a copy. It's a copy of the real temple. It's a copy of the real house. The real house is where the Lord resides. Not where we want him to reside. We can't pick up a patch of land and say, Lord, this is your home. Come and live here. Because the man who is pointing out to the land and saying, Lord, come and here, at that time he doesn't realize that the Lord is already living in his head, in the same body with which he is pointing out. That this physical body, that this physical human body is the real temple, is the real house of Lord. We forget it. And we run out outside and try to look for these buildings. And this house of the Lord, this temple of the Lord, the real thing, it is so perfect, so beautifully designed. It has the microcosmic form of all levels of creation. I cannot imagine anything more perfect. If anyone can, please enlighten me. I have not seen anything more perfect in this creation, in this whole universe, compared to a human body. I have not seen anything more perfect than a small piece, six feet, Maybe seven, some of you, yeah? maybe five. <laughs> Just a small little, small little structure of flesh and bones and tissues and cells. This small little structure should have imbued with consciousness, filled with life, have the capacity within itself to experience all the energy levels that exist in the nether lands and in this land, in the physical land, in the astral land, in the heaven, in the ultimate house of God, and should have within itself God himself. Have you ever seen anything more perfect than this? That the very creator and all his creation is packed in microcosmic form in this human body? And how are we treating this human body? This is the real thing to look after. If we see the whole creation, the trees and the lakes and the land and the sky and the clouds and the human beings and the animals and birds and spirits, and ideas and planets and interplanetary travel, if we see everything available to us, nothing exceeds the excellence of a single human body. And how do we treat this human body? All kinds of evil thoughts we put into it, all kinds of junk food we put into it, all kinds of dirty things we put into it, all kinds of things our own mind says is evil, even the evil mind says is evil, we do with this body. And then we claim to be looking for the house of the Lord. What a great hypocrisy we are indulging in. And what is history of man telling us? History of man tells us that if somebody just breaks or removes one little brick from a man-made house of God, we are willing to destroy by the thousands the house of God that the God himself created. This is our history, our background. And we think that we are seekers of God and we want to live in His will. How can we live in His will? And who makes us do all these things? Our own mind. Nobody else comes from outside. Great Master made it clear we have no enemy in this world. There's only one enemy we have and that sits right inside us. Our own mind. Our own mind, our own thoughts, our own sense of Relying upon this thinking machine inside for everything is our only enemy. 
There is nothing standing between us and the Lord. The Lord is inside us. There is nothing standing between us. There is no wall except this mind. If we could remove this mind, there is nothing between us and the Lord. And here, we are nurturing this wall. Think more. Develop your mind. Mental power. Positive thinking. Do everything to build up the wall. And do nothing to see what is behind the wall. So close are we to the Lord. If somebody says, how close are we to the Lord? Do we have to travel a thousand miles? Of course not. One mile? Certainly not. Not even as far as Milwaukee? No. As far as other room? No. As far as this cup from me? No. This is too far away from the Lord. As far as my forehead? No. Is it as far as this little space? No. Because the Lord and the soul, the seeker, are in the identical place in the third eye center at one place just behind the others. There is no gap between them. Locationally, they are together. And yet a little conscious stream of mental thinking divides us and separates us. We live in the same house. The soul and its, and its master, its creator, its lord, they both live in the same house. They cry for each other. They both love each other. They both are looking for each other. And they never talk to each other. The Lord keeps on sending messages. Because he has to send a message through a mirror. If, if my beloved were to look, stand near and look that side and doesn't listen to me, I say, is there a mirror where I can send a reflected message? The Lord is sending reflected messages. We keep on looking beyond the mirror. We won't see. We enjoy the mirror more than we enjoy Looking, turning around and looking at the Lord. I am telling you these things because I learned them from the great master in very simple words. I was very small. I was very small when I met him. I grew up. When I grew up, I felt I was trapped. Maybe if I had grown up with another master, I would have been talking of that master. I grew up there. I might have grown up in a, in a different religion in a different country and would have grown up with those thoughts. I recognized I could have been conditioned. I could have been totally mentally conditioned to accept what was around. And this, this thought came to me early enough to say this is all conditioning. This just because you happen to be in that circumstance, you enjoyed it, you are all, you just caught in a trap. Your mind has been caught in a trap because you were there, you heard this, and you are now so influenced, you can't see anything equal to it. So when I grew up to think of these things, when I grew up and became big enough, not too big, maybe, I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> big enough to go to great master and get initiated from him so that he could tell me what the path was all about. What was I supposed to do to break this wall of the mind and get in? And I was old enough to do that, which was little over 10 years of age. At that time, he told me a wonderful thing, almost as if he read my mind. He said, my friend, what I am telling you, I learned from my master, Babaji. Babaji taught me, it worked for me. I am sharing with you, maybe it will work for you. If it doesn't, go look for something else. Go look around. See all the masters. See what they teach you. Find out if there's something better. Maybe they'll give you something that goes ahead of what I am giving you. If you do find at any time, anything, anywhere, that goes beyond what I am sharing with you, don't come back to me to take my permission. First accept it. Take it first. Then come back and tell me, so I may also go and take it. These are the words of the great master. They had such a profound effect on me. Not only because of the openness with which he said, and the fact that he was not saying, look, I alone know the truth. Nobody else can know. I am the highest. Which I had heard a lot of people talking about their guru. Their guru alone was the highest. Their religion alone had the answers. Their cult alone knew. I had heard this so much. And here was a guru who said, no. Look for anything better. When you find it, take it. And come back and tell me, so I may also go and take it. Now, he said this to many people, not to me alone. 
I saw other people. Many of those people, I asked them, do you remember? He said, this. they said, no, we don't remember that. We only remember the steps of initiation. I said, don't you remember? He said, go and look for something better. They said, we don't even remember. But I remembered. Maybe my intellect, maybe some part of me, the questioning part, was trying to raise his head and said, must get the answers. Don't be fooled. Too many people are being fooled. There are too many people who swap your mind for their mind. Too many people who substitute their own thinking with your thinking and say, we've given you a high lift into higher region. Too many people are being deceived by hypnotism. Too many people are being deceived by suggestion. And I said, I must not get caught in this. I was over cautious not to be caught by a possible suggestion in what the great master was saying. So, instead of merely waiting in my life, during the events of my life, that if something turned up and I saw it is better, I may take it, otherwise I am content. I went out of my way to search for something that should be better than the teachings of the great master. I met more gurus than anyone I know of yet, all over the world. First time I came to this country, besides several gurus who, who did not know a thing about uh, spirituality, and they were still called gurus. Apart from that, I had an interesting meeting with a fat man in Minneapolis. <laughs> I don't know if I shared this with you. <laughs> that meeting was arranged by some friends of mine. That man was the president of the Witches Association of the United States. I said, I'd like to meet a man who has been handling these witches. <laughs> because early on, I had a very strange experience that when I heard of witchcraft, I went to great master. And I said, master, they say there are witches and there are people possessed and there are spirits and there are disembodied things. Do they really exist or are they just figments of the imagination? He said, they exist as figments of the imagination. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I said, you blowing hot and cold. He says, no, I am not. The figments of imagination can create real experiences. I am not telling you the untruth. That's the truth. But if a figment of the imagination becomes a reality, it's as good as real for the person who is involved. If somebody else can tell him, somebody else can pull him out. I said, Master, I'd like to see some of these figments. <laughs> he said, no, why are you concerned? Because these figments distract us. They poison us. They put negative things into us. They take us astray. They don't take us on the path towards real knowledge and real heaven and real house of the Lord. They take you on side trips here and there. You don't want to waste your time. I said, Master, sometimes I have a little extra time. <laughs> <laughs> but he told me that if you ever come across these ghosts and witches and disembodied spirits, don't mess around too much with them. And if you don't like them, he gave me the five great words of the initiation. He put the power into those words, a mantra, and he said, they will run when they hear this. I tried the running part first, wherever I heard. They ran like nobody's business. So after a while, I, I found that being constantly accustomed to doing Simran for repetition, I lost all contact with these figments and these witches and these ghosts and so on. So I had a hard time and a lot of people would say, uh, we, have, we are accosted by ghosts and spirits and I would say, tell them he wants to meet you. They would run away from those people also. It happened in this country on several visits of mine. Those people who are bothered by spirits have never been bothered again. The spirits don't take a chance. They are too afraid. But I had a nice meeting with the fat man, the president of the witches association, except when I met him. And he was very happy. He said, I am glad to see somebody from the East coming up and understanding my language. And I said, yeah, I know all these ghosts and witches personally. And I said, that? He began to shake. He shook like a jelly. He said, go, go. <laughs> the meeting was very shortly. That was one of the earlier meetings, way back, much before I moved to this country. Here, is, here are negative forces around us. 
they are created by the same mind. Negativity is created by our own mind. And that negativity can take hold of us and can mess us up. And these simple positive associations with a human being whom we call a great master can take care of all this. I tried out a lot of things. I have met so many masters of all kinds. Not only did I not meet as of today, because tomorrow I don't know, as of today, I have not met anybody who has not only not taught me or indicated to me beyond what Great Master gave me, he has not even come up anywhere close to what the Great Master said. He has not even been able to describe physically, intellectually, in a structured form, anything close to what the Great Master explained. So as of today, I have not found anything to beat the challenge of the Great Master. If you find somebody who teaches you better, go and take it. I am still waiting. But now my patience is getting exhausted. Because I waited so long. In physical terms, I just passed the age of retirement. This is the first Bandara I am here after I turned 65. So I should now take it easy. Even in my search for any higher guru or a new guru that I may find. I am very content. Some things that Great Master gave me, I can never forget. He gave me a focus, focal point in life. That life has so many ups and downs. Human life is built of ups and downs. I have not come across a human being who didn't have ups and downs. Not yet. I have come across people who thought they had more ups and fewer downs. Some who thought they were down in the dumps all the time, never got up. But I have not come across one who was always on the ascendant or one who was always on the descendant. The truth is they can't exist. If they were always on the ascendant, they would be in heaven, not here. If they were always on the descendant, they'd be in hell, not here. To be alive here in the physical plane, you have to have a mixture of destiny, a mixture of events in your life that take you up and down. Sometimes more up, sometimes more down, but ups and downs are part of human life. And this combination of events of life, events of thought, events of mind, event, physical events and mental events, which take you up and down, this combination is a must for physical existence. We cannot be a human being unless we have this combination. Therefore, some people come to me and say, I was very lucky, but this has been a bad turn for me now. This was a bad year. I said, thank God. <laughs> Otherwise, you may have missed all the opportunity of meeting a perfect master. You have no chance of meeting a perfect master except when you are human. Because it is only when you are human, you have seeking. You can only seek when you are ignorant. When you feel you are ignorant and have a choice. These are the requisite, prerequisites for looking for a master. You should be ignorant, know nothing, be full of doubts, not sure, have a question and say, I can decide. If you have these qualifications, you can be a seeker. If you don't have these qualifications, you are just living a routine life, like a robot. Every creature in this world is living the life of a robot. Look at these trees. They are robotic. Look at the fish. They are robotic. Look at the birds. They are robotic. Look at the clouds, they are robotic. Look at the molecules and the atoms, they are robotic. Look at energy, it's robotic. Look at anything in the world, it's robotic. Except the human being who says, hmm, let me decide. <laughs> it is this distinction. It is this experience of free will. This experience that I have a will. <clears throat> and I am free to choose. It is this requirement that makes one a seeker. And this does not exist anywhere in creation. I am not talking of the physical world. Those who are accustomed to higher levels of experiences, astral worlds, out of body experiences, causal worlds, mental things they can see, those who can see numbers walking and colors flying, even for them I am telling you, in no region of creation does this exist, that a choice can be made except the physical plane and a human being Becoming a seeker, that's the only choice. What a great thing. If somebody, some life force 
were existing and said, I want to take a form which is the highest form. Somebody flying in the astral region, somebody flying in heaven wants to say, I want to take a form. I am formless. I am energy. I am consciousness. But I want to take a form, the highest form I can take. It would be the physical form, the physical human form on this planet Earth or any similar planet that has human beings. This is the only form. Therefore, this human form has been called next to God. There are only two beings who have this experience of free will. The creator who freely decided to set up this pattern and the human being who thinks he can decide freely. <laughs> but nobody else has this experience either. There are only two. Therefore, this man, which includes women, <laughs> has been made in the image of the Creator. It is truly said, accurately said, and it is literally truthful that this human being has been made in the image of the Creator. Not because of the eyes and the nose. People start looking at the body and say, oh, this body, maybe the Creator looks like this too. The Creator in this unmanifest form sits in such khand, the true home, the permanent home, our permanent kingdom. He sits there, the creator. If we can isolate him and make him a he or a she or a it or whatever, if we can make the creator a being sitting in heaven, then the creator sits there unmanifest. We don't know. But supposing we went up through all the regions, flew into the skies of the astral region, into causal region, into far from beyond these universes, and flew as a soul into our own real home, the Satchkhand, the true home. And we said, let me see you being, where are you? 